This is Speaking of Shakespeare, a series of conversations about things Shakespearean, with a focus on new digital technologies and also about developments in Shakespearean performance and education across the globe. I'm Thomas Dabbs, recording this introduction from Aoyama Gakuin University in central Tokyo. The following conversation is with Brett Greatly Hirsch, who is University Academic Fellow in Textual Studies and Digital Editing, University of Leeds. This conversation is made possible with the help of institutional support from Aoyama Gakuin University. This series is also funded by a generous grant from the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science called Kaken. And this organization, thankfully, includes support for research in the humanities. Hi, Brett. Good morning to you. How are you? Yoroshika uh, nagaishimasu. Okay. Uh, how are you, Tom? How was my pronunciation? Is it awful? Uh, it's, it's getting there. Yeah. Yoroshika. Okay. Uh, is arigato, arigato. Arigato. Okay, that's good. That's getting there. That's where you start. And yes, you... good. <laughs> and you've, 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 you've nearly exhausted my Japanese. Although I can sing <laughs> a, um, a couple, uh, a couple verses of Old MacDonald Had a Farm. That's Ooh. that is the extent of my Japanese learning. Uh, you know, as a primary school kid in Australia. <laughs> Old MacDonald. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, we, you are a musician, and we're going to get into that at one point. Oh no! <laughs> okay. uh, I, I, no, I, I watched. I uh, saw you on YouTube uh, playing the Irish pipe, the Irish pipe, oh, or, wow. and I, I've forgotten the name of it. But we'll get to that in just a second. Okay. I kind of want to focus on your uh, extraordinary accomplishments here over the years since I've seen you, which I think. The last time I saw you was in 2013 in, in Oxford at the uh, EBO conference, uh, Early English Books Online. And that's it just could be that long ago. Yeah, yeah. It, it could be that long ago. Uh, and I think we've been crossing paths. You, you were in Australia. I was in Australia for a digital conference. And 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 now you're at Leeds in uh, in the UK. And and you seem to be the, the very established there right now uh, in your position. I'm uh, certainly trying to make myself indispensable. <laughs> <laughs> as, as are we all. Mm. Uh, yeah, it gets harder and harder as the years go, go by. Uh, but I have already introduced you and in your, your title, a very impressive title. And what I wanted to start out with, I think the most uh, immediate thing that you're you've been working on and I hear your name all all across the world when I go to conferences is the work that you've done with digital renaissance editions well for people who may not know what it is just explain uh, what it is and how it's going and what your goals are if you could right so um, digital renaissance editions is a project to publish critical editions of the drama and literature uh, from Shakespeare's period and the period just before and the period just after. So um, Tudor and Stuart uh, just before the restoration. Um, we publish open access. So one of the reasons for putting the project together was uh, I realized pretty quickly that we couldn't uh, wait for print editorial series to uh, commission uh, um, volumes of the most obscure plays because there'd be no market demand for them and therefore no financial incentive for them to put these plays out. Uh, but that means that you uh, never get to read the vast majority of the plays and literature from the period. So um, this is where Digital Renaissance Editions comes in. It's, uh, it's a uh, publishing platform, it's peer reviewed. At the moment, we've got three completed editions. Uh, we've got Joost Dalder's edition of parts one and two of The Honest Whore, which uh, for, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the play, it's basically the 17th century precursor of Pretty Woman, uh, you know, a bad girl turned good. Uh, and Eleanor Lowe, 
has also edited uh, George Chapman's Humorous Day's Mirth, which is the first humor play. We've got plenty more in the pipeline, uh, but but that's that's the project in a nutshell. Yeah, yeah. I just love the idea because, of course, I'm in Japan, but I think this is pretty much ubiquitous all, all around. It gets harder and harder to find editions and well-edited editions of these plays and of, of a lot of other authors and so forth. And what happens is this canon that has been uh, diligently formed from the 19th through the 20th century of, of all of this activity around Shakespeare that shows so clearly that it wasn't just Shakespeare. Shakespeare was, of course, a very big deal, but there was this incredible body of work that our forebears found to be extraordinary, in some cases more enjoyable than certain Shakespeare plays. You know, when you get into Marlowe and and the, the playwrights that you have met uh, mentioned, uh, Thomas Kidd, uh, you know, we could go on and on, but there, this was an entire movement. It would be like, uh, what, studying rock and roll and staying only with the Beatles. Uh, but the problem is the, the marketplace does not sustain uh, some, a playwright that may have only two or three or maybe just one play uh, that uh, you, you don't get the, the joy of, uh, of a continual reception with a one hit wonder from that particular period. Uh, but what I wanted to ask you about is annotations. It seems to take quite a long time to edit the to edit this, the play and then provide the links for the annotations. That that is quite a complicated and kind of long going process. Yeah, I mean, uh, um, there are different types of annotation. So, I think the most laborious are the textual notes. Yes, uh, things like things like. Uh, your collation of textual variants and of historical editions. So where you as an editor may have adopted one reading but rejected others. Yeah. Uh, that, that is um, sort of the best practice about coming, coming clean about the decisions that you're making as an editor. But, but uh, that process of documentation is, is quite laborious. The other kind of annotation which I suppose students and readers are more familiar with uh, the sort of critical annotations, the glosses of unfamiliar words. Um, these also take take quite a while to write because there's a lot of research that goes into each of these. So in in uh, one of the Honest Hall plays, uh, there are there are some bawdy references to some phallic shaped vegetables, as you can imagine. Uh, but uh, uh, for so, so when Yost had originally written this, I, I pointed out to him that the same joke was still present in um, uh, sort of modern comedies. And I showed him a clip from the second season of Blackadder. Ah, uh, with Hugh Laurie. So we, yeah. Yeah. So, so because it's a digital edition, we've actually incorporated that clip from Blackadder as part of that annotation. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Uh, you can imagine the problems I have with particularly comic exchanges in Japan to try to translate. And, you know, once you try to explain why something is funny, it stops being funny if you don't, <laughs> if you don't do it correctly. Uh, but the, uh, uh, well, for instance, I'm thinking at the beginning of Romeo and Juliet when the two courtiers are just making these coal carrying um, I think there's a pun on, you know, carrying coals and that sort of thing. Uh, and also the, it, it's, it's a struggle to get through, but it's very helpful if we have an addition. We don't yet. We do with Hamlet on the um, Internet Shakespeare, where you can just click and it just gives you a fairly quick uh, meaning of the word that seems to satisfy my students or the meaning of a phrase. Uh, so that's so important, but it takes such a long, long time uh, to get. Yeah, so, and there will be there will be references that we simply have lost, you know. So there will be there will be um, topical allusions that we may never completely recover from these plays and these texts. And, but that's just part of you know the way history works. Yeah. Um, I think comedy comedy dates much. Uh, 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 comedy dates quicker than than other genres of play, mm. I think, for that reason. 
I mean, you were talking about the way that your students in Japan maybe struggle with struggle with some of the Renaissance humor. I I recently watched a um, a Korean production of Ben Johnson's Volpone, and I have absolutely zero Korean, but I could still appreciate the humor because, uh, um, you know, this is this is theater. It is action. We can still appreciate the, the sort of slapstick. Uh, uh, slapstick comedy and timing and and facial expressions these are all uh, uh, you know fairly universal aspects of comedy I agree with you it can be difficult especially if you're stuck with uh, just just looking at words on a page rather than seeing them um, sort of materialized in performance yeah yeah but really what you're doing if we throw back if we just go back to maybe the, the late 18th, but mainly the early 19th century, uh, as you and I both know, many of these playwrights had fallen into obscurity. It was Shakespeare, pretty much Shakespeare only for uh, what, 150 years and more. Uh, and when the ability came, when the paper got cheaper, when more people could read and you know, growing middle class, I've never read a history where there wasn't a growing middle class, but there was a growing middle class. And suddenly you got these additions. You got the Dodsley plays, you got the Ox, William Oxbury, you know, in the early night, just throwing them out, you know, editing, editing them and selling them. You know, it was, it was working then, but, uh, and it worked for a long time thereafter. But once most of this entered into a kind of academic setting and so forth, uh, I have a little story. I was uh, I teach a graduate class in Shakespeare, and one year, maybe 15 years ago, I said we're going to do all Shakespeare this year. We're going to do Marlowe. We're going to do a couple of other plays, uh, Webster. We're going to do that. And I set up the syllabus for the class and came into class. And normally there would be somewhere between five to eight students there, and there was just one student, and it was my student, and, and she had to be there because she was my student. I said, where is everybody? She said, man, they, they, want, to, they want to study Shakespeare. Mm. So I said, well, go out to the lounge, to the graduate student lounge and tell them we're going to do Othello. And, uh, and then I worked in uh, another play from Marlowe and over the year, but they wanted to start, it, start with uh, Shakespeare. And so that mentality is, has come up and you miss so much good drama that way. But with your sight, as it's developing, people will have the ability to go into, uh, to, to have a, an accessible text. And it's just a wonderful contribution to the, you know, in everything, the humanities, the uh, Renaissance drama or early modern drama. And- No, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Of course, the approaches are not mutually exclusive. I'm thinking here of some of the other print editorial series who often, uh, uh, um, advertise some of their unfamiliar plays in relation to uh, more uh, popular Shakespeare material that might be taught with it. So um, I think Matthew Dimmock put out an edition of a Turk play and mm -hmm. the publisher, uh, which was then Ashgate, which mm -hmm. is now Rutledge, mm -hmm. uh, advertised this as 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 the sort of thing that you might teach alongside Othello. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's not an uncommon approach. And I think uh, it's not just difficult uh, uh, to get students interested in, in material that they're uh, 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 perhaps not yet familiar with, but, but it's also difficult for us as teachers and educators. You know, we, we like to stick with things that we're familiar with. So, so part of the part of the outreach, uh, a, a program of digital Renaissance editions, if you will, is is to make these things available so that they can become familiar. Well, it's just wonderful work, and I see that you are doing an edition of Fair M. That brings back some <laughs> memories. <laughs> and my memory of it is that it has a fairly good ending. It's not nobody's heart is cut out like in tis pity she's a whore or you know and no. nothing, it's, it's just one of these uh it's uh, ha happier it's a happier play 
And it's good, it's good to bring that in because so much of the non-Shakespearean canon is Jacobean or Spanish tragedy or Tamburlaine or, you know, it really um, wonderful stuff, but it can be kind of violent. So it's nice to have a, a, a little bit more of a, a little milder theme there. Also, you're reproducing English Renaissance drama. Now that's a study of editing and publishing so you are actually, it's a little bit meta in a sense that you are editing and then you're also doing a study of the history of editing over a, a long period, over the centuries of textual editing and, uh, and the relation to canon formation. Now that's a big, big project, Brett, that's huge. Yeah, and it's not one that I'm gonna finish anytime soon, I'm afraid. <laughs> But the idea, um, a couple of years ago, Jeremy Lopez published a book uh, uh, um, that was called Constructing the Canon of Early Modern Drama. And Lopez, in a series of uh, micro chapters, offers, offers sort of readings of, of what he sees as the canon of Renaissance drama. But um, his, his model of the canon uh, is uh, one that is limited to a, a handful of printed anthologies. So these include, say, the Dodsley yes. anthologies. Um, and I thought that, that that's quite a narrow view of canon formation. Um, and so I thought uh, uh, um, I, would, I would set out to sort of do the same things, try and, try and observe uh, uh, you know, canon, canon formation over a long period of time, looking at uh, patterns that emerge in, in the types of plays that are being edited, uh, the types of plays that are being ignored, uh, sort of uh, trends and fashions in editing and publishing mm -hmm. over a long period of time, but, but, but doing so in a way that it was more holistic. So not just looking at printed anthologies, but looking at uh, dedicated uh, collected works editions, single volume, but also not limiting myself just to the professional drama, also looking at university drama, masks, uh, entertainments, uh, closet drama. The model of early English drama that I'm producing is much broader. It's not just limited to uh, um, a bunch of anthologies and for the most part, just Shakespeare and his contemporaries. So it's much more holistic. Well, I can't wait to see what you come up with. Uh, it, it really does work if you charted it on some type of um, graph. It's, it's sort of like a stock market exchange that uh, goes up and down and uh, sometimes down and never back up. Sometimes it stays stable, uh, a, a given play or a given playwright, depending on the reception of that and how it, I guess how it's framed for the audience it's being directed for. And uh, it, I think it's fascinating stuff. It's a history of the study of consciousness, kind of a social consciousness, uh, as well as uh, editing and, and the, um, uh, the other things that go with editing. Uh, yeah, so. I mean, it's as much uh, um, a study of um, us as readers of these plays and and of publishers and the way that those uh, um, um, financial incentives and market demands drive uh, um, how, how the canon is shaped and reshaped over time. So for example, uh, um, um, coming off the back of, of, uh, of, of um, feminist literary criticism in the 90s, there was quite a lot of call for uh, uh, say greater access to plays written by women. And so you suddenly had uh, the appearance of editions of uh, um, Carey's tragedy of Mariam. Mm -hmm. uh, but this was subsequently dropped from the uh, large teaching anthologies uh, because people weren't teaching it. Oh. So, so I think, um, I mean, I'd have to check my notes, but I think the Longman anthology included it, but then dropped it. Uh, Norton included it and then dropped it. But that's one example of the way that uh, sort of publishers respond to a perceived demand 
and then uh, um, you know sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Well, the great thing about having an open access platform is it doesn't cost you lots of money to keep a play up there and to have it sitting there ready for discovery. And uh, so you don't have to, you don't have the cost of reprinting it in the next edition. So, it, it, so there's an advantage there. That's true, but open access publishing is, 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 is actually more expensive than people think. Oh yeah. So, oh yeah. So, yeah. Uh, in in the same way that publishing a book uh, basically means you can put it on a shelf and forget about it, uh, yeah. you can't do the same with an open access digital edition no. because no. because the bookshelf keeps changing. Yes. Uh, um, you know the actual material, the 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 hardware and the software that's necessary for you to continue accessing it keeps changing, and so it's it's um, it's uh, chasing a moving target just to ensure that the material you've already produced remains accessible. Uh, so so uh, projects like Digital Renaissance Editions rely on um, um, substantial contributions from uh, um, funding agencies, but also uh, higher education institutions. And so we've been uh, really lucky that the University of Victoria in British Columbia has um, invested uh, uh, substantial in-kind contributions. Uh, um, and so they have a dedicated uh, humanities computing and um, media center whose who's, uh, 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 um, uh, sort of mandate is to, is to develop and maintain digital projects uh, for the university. And so without them, you know, we would, we would become uh, 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 um, quickly obsolete. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was talking in an earlier conversation with Alexa Jovan, and she was uh, singing your praises and also uh, talking about how the model that uh, was set up for uh, the um, uh, ISE, Internet Shakespeare Editions, that it's a sustainable model, that people can come and go but the platform is set up to where people can come in and continue the work over time. And uh, DRE, I think, is set up very much, it looks to me very much the same way uh, behind the scenes where you, you're basically building a, a cathedral. You know, it, it may go beyond, of course, the life of a, a student who moves on to another job and has to do other things, but uh, it's, it's uh, built to continue over a long period of time and remain stable. Well, we're building the library. Um, we've had to move cathedrals, if, if you will, because the the um, the publishing platform that Michael Best originally developed over yes. um, a series of decades uh, 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 just just simply wasn't working anymore. It was um, it was something of a Frankenstein's monster. If if you <laughs> were a software developer, uh, um, um, you know, which is not unusual for sort of long running digital projects. When you have new needs and new functions, you develop, uh, you know, new applications and new software pipelines to meet those needs. You don't uh, uh, scrap everything and start from scratch. And so you you end up with this hulking mass. The problem was that uh, some of the some of the software architecture that this was built on uh, was was no longer supported, uh. both by its both by its developers, but also by the university um, IT department because it presented a security risk. So we needed to abandon the unstable foundations of the cathedral that Michael had set up. Um, Thankfully, we have a brand spanking new cathedral that that is being built up, and that's Lemdo. That's the link to early modern drama online. So this is the brainchild of Janelle Genstad, who you might know as the sort of director of the Map of Early Modern London. Now, the difference between Lemdo and other uh, publishing platforms is that Lemdo has been built from the outset using open technologies and open standards. So it's not a Frankenstein's monster of, of sort of picking and choosing what happens to work. Uh, um, but it's also been built to be uh, compliant with the endings project. So this is another project that's come out of the University of Victoria. They were looking around and they were noticing how many digital humanities projects die. 
because because people don't plan for long-term sustainability and preservation. And uh, uh, I mean, partly that's on the projects themselves, but that's also a failing in um, the way that uh, uh, grant funders uh, 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 um, have approached funding these projects. Uh, you know, if, if if you're funding a traditional project whose output is a book, you don't need to worry about ongoing maintenance. The book is there. It, as long as you still have libraries and people have eyes and they can read them, that's fine. But if the output is a digital uh, uh, um, project, then that that needs ongoing maintenance and support. And there are very few funders who actually have that built in. So, so there is very much a risk of technological obsolescence in a lot of these digital projects. And so the endings project came along and said, okay, what we need to do is come up with some best practices and, and some principles so that people who are interested in doing these sorts of digital projects can, can ensure uh, you know, to the best of their abilities, that these things are going to be available and, and accessible and usable in the long term. And so Lemdo is, is uh, 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 um, compliant with these principles. So what this means, though, is that we've had to rethink um, sort of what it is that Digital Renaissance Editions does. So before, you know, when I first got into this, I thought, wow, digital is going to be everything. We can throw everything at it. Uh, you know, you got movies. Sure, we'll take movies. You've got you've got 3D, 3D interactive uh, models. Sure, give us that. You know, we'll we'll host it. Um, giant performance database. Sure, we'll do that. No. Uh, even just building, building uh, um, sort of relational databases, you know, the sort of bread and butter of digital work, these things break down too. And so what we're seeing uh, because of projects like the Endings Project and, and uh, people who are turning around and sort of reflecting on this drive, uh, uh, this, this sort of heady uh, early drive towards um, uh, maximism, in the digital, people are taking stock of this and thinking, well, actually, no, um, uh, it might be better to, to, to narrow our focus on doing uh, fewer things really well, but making, making the data open and available so that if somebody else wants to come and do uh, you know, the, the performance database or somebody else wants to make translations of these or somebody else wants to do uh, computational stylistics and uh, so authorship attribution, they can take your data and they can do that. That's fine. But, but we are going to focus on doing our little thing and doing it well. So DRE has, has narrowed its focus now. Um, um, and this is because of Lemdo. The focus of Lemdo really is the text. It's the text and the edition and the apparatus. And so uh, um, we won't have all of the bells and whistles that you know, we were previously hoping to do and sort of promised to do. But as a result of that decision, our work is more accessible. It's more sustainable. In fact, you could collapse digital Renaissance editions to sit on a thumb drive and it wouldn't have any server side dependencies or internet dependencies. It would still work. That is the point of the endings compliance. Uh, um, and we think that that's the right decision because other people can come along and take our data and do the other sort of whiz bang visual stuff or translation work. Uh, um, and so all of the stuff that's published on digital Renaissance editions or on Lemdo is, is uh, released using a creative commons license. <laughs> You know, we have no problem with with uh, people people taking the work and uh, you know doing doing great things with it. Well, this is just great news. It's great news. I I didn't know that there was that much going on behind the scenes, and uh, it's it's extremely important to have this type of uh, foundation uh, that can be built on, and it doesn't obsolesce every five years or so, yeah. But you mentioned while you were explaining that computational stylistics and for our mm -hmm. listeners, I want, I find this to be an extremely interesting, controversial uh, area of study and you are in it. And 
uh, compu computational stylistics really, it does a lot of things, but uh, determining authorship, which people are very, very mm, fussy about at certain, <laughs> certain points. And also it can clear up a lot and it's, uh, it's leading to some, some what I think uh, very exciting, uh, what re revisions of our understanding of how plays were written, how they were put together, uh, you know, what really happened rather than what we want to imagine happened. Uh, and it's, it's sort of defeating the idea of the single genius author doing this by himself, by herself or whatnot, and showing much more of a collaboration in, in this period. And uh, you joined the Thomas Nash project mm -hmm. and Nash, Nash, I never tire of Nash. It's, it's so entertaining. But the trouble is, it's very difficult to remember everything that happened because he was all part of that uh, Mark related stuff. And, and I, I, I learn it and then I forget it two years later and I have to go back and relearn it again. Uh, but basically, I wanted to focus on the work that you did with Hugh Craig on stylistics. And he has done some very, very interesting work. And by the way, I was contacted privately by a person out there who has assured me that Marlowe did not write Tamburlaine. And, um, and I'm not sure about that. Uh, he was using a, a, he was using what was called rolling delta. And he felt, he feels like he's established that. But what kind of things are happening now in, in cutting edge here with stylistic examination? I'm probably on the conservative end of, of the authorship attribution stuff. I'm, I'm, um, I'm a bit more cautious with this stuff. Um, I like to deal in sort of big data approaches. Mm -hmm. So I think the smallest chunk of text that I'd be comfortable with is about 2000 words. Mm -hmm. I'm not, um, um, I'm not yet convinced that we can, we can do micro attribution. Uh, 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 I mean, there are some, there are some uh, persuasive and, and tantalizing studies that have been done uh, um, also in relation to Marlowe uh, and his and his potential contributions to the Shakespeare canon mm -hmm. using these sort of micro attribution techniques but I'm 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 cautious about that but I'm also uh, 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 um, not entirely persuaded by the by the um, search for sort of shared phrases either this is the sort of thing that um uh sam samuel schoenbaum and uh muriel uh, 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 uh sorry uh, uh, um sinclair burn uh mm -hmm. sort of talked about uh in in sort of previous generations uh, um i think just because the computer makes it a lot easier for us to identify uh, shared phrases doesn't mean that we can throw out all of the other considerations that are there like uh, you know the other explanations for there being shared phrases and the use of use of rare words. My comfort zone is is big data, high frequency words, um, sort of the the so called function words, the words that everybody uses because they have to, because you couldn't uh, uh, string together a sentence that 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 you know carried any meaning without them. So function words are those words that carry a primarily grammatical function, sort of as the to uh, uh, personal pronouns as well. But but um, as the glue that that sort of holds holds our sentences together, they're they're um, they're a really useful proxy for style uh, because because the way that we construct our sentences varies from writer to writer. Yeah, I uh, I push back because of course you know I could live the rest of my life and go to my death and believe that Marlowe wrote Tamburlaine and that would make me a, a very happy guy <laughs> okay even if it turned out that somehow that didn't happen but I still have this sort of holdout maybe old school belief that I just feel a structural integrity when I read those plays that whatever it was this was a very strong author now, however, he may have collaborated in Faustus. And it's almost certain that you know there was some collaboration going on there, particularly with the comic scenes and so forth. But in a play like Tamburlaine that holds that integrity all the way through, it seems to me, uh, I think it's hard to just rip it away from Marlowe 
and try to give it to someone else. But then again, I don't know. I, I really, I have not worked closely enough with this. Well, I mean, you are, you are uh, very familiar with the Marlow Canon. I mean, I've got your book, book here about the 19th century sort of rediscovery of and canonization of Marlow sitting here somewhere with, with its nice purple cover. Um, I mean, the problem with the Marlow Canon is that, is that there's actually very little um, external evidence for his authorship of, of say most of the plays. So Tamburlaine, if we were being bibliographically conservative, we would be forced to acknowledge that it is actually a, um, an anonymous play. Yeah. Uh, Marlow doesn't appear in the stationer's, uh, stationer's register. Uh, he's not on the title page of any of the early editions. And I mean, you'll have to forgive me if I'm wrong because I'm just working by memory here, but I think, I think the only external evidence for, for Marlowe's authorship of the Tamburlaine plays comes from a scant marginal annotation in a theological work some 30 or 40 years later, which is annotating a section of the Tamburlaine story that says Marlowe his poem or something, something like that. So that's, that's really thin evidence yeah. for, for say, uh, uh, um, somebody, somebody's authorship. That, that, that's, that's thin external evidence. The internal evidence is where the computational stylistic stuff comes in. But, but um, the two have to, have to be sort of used in tandem. So you can't generate a stylistic profile based on, based on uh, works uh, unless you are convinced that the works that you are using are sole authored and well attributed. Mm -hmm. uh, and so with an author like Marlowe, unless uh, you, you're willing to be a bit more uh, forgiving and not as conservative as I would like to be, I think doing that kind of work becomes very difficult. Yeah. So for Marlowe, I think the only play that, that has never been challenged and does actually have Marlowe uh, uh, sort of credited on the title page, and nobody's ever suggested might be a collaboration, is Edward II. Mm -hmm. and, that's, and that's not enough uh, to generate a stylistic profile. Really? My, my, really? That's, you need a lot more. Yeah. The oh. difficult, well, you want, you want more data. Mm -hmm. Really, so with someone like Shakespeare, who has who has quite a substantial canon that survived, that's not a problem. Mm -hmm. For people uh, like like Nash, if if we were testing testing for dramatic authorship, uh, Nash is a bit of a problem because we've only got the one sole authored, well attributed play to Nash's name. That's Summer's Last Will and Testament, but that's not a professional play. It's an amateur drama you know, that was written for a, 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 a specific occasion in a great house. Uh, and in many ways, it behaves very differently from the drama uh, that Nash potentially contributed to uh, with Marlowe in writing Dido, Queen of Carthage. And so those sorts of tests become very difficult to distinguish between, between authorship and genre. The sorts of tests that we're doing uh, are... Uh, are very sensitive to both and it's sometimes difficult to disentangle them and that comes down to a lack of data yeah. if if we had more uh nash sole authored well attributed plays if we had more marlowe sole authored well attributed plays uh, then this kind of work would be uh, much easier but we we have to make do with what we have yeah. Unfortunately, sometimes that means that we just have to live with not knowing or, you know, come to terms with the ambiguity. Yeah. Well, I'm guilty. I, I wrote an article years ago about uh, the 10 years after Marlowe's death was basically when this playwright, this, uh, this brand was constructed uh, po posthumously. And so Marlowe is a very difficult, uh, very difficult figure to pin down 
in terms of the records that you have brought up. And I don't want to get too much into the weeds, primarily because I will embarrass myself with how much I've forgotten in the interim, because there's quite a lot of information uh, to, to have to deal with. But I, I, I see this as having a future. I see it in what's coming up recently in the reconsideration of the Henry VI plays, which I always thought were a little bit uh, you know, scattered around a bit. Uh, they didn't seem to be that, they didn't seem to have the integrity that, well, say Tamberlane seems to have to me, and it could have been an integrity, and by that I mean a consistent style throughout two fairly long plays. It could be, in an, I think both of those plays were primarily written by the same guy, but that's only because that's the way I feel. You know, it has nothing to do with mm -hmm. any uh, empirical research. But the, again, the way I felt when I first read the Henry VI, the three plays is that there, there seemed to be a fluctuation in style in those plays. Uh, the, I think maybe Dowden years ago or some of the others used that to, in a kind of Darwinistic view of the ev ev evolution of Shakespeare, you know, from a young playwright to mid-level to finally this. And, but I, I thought, no, probably there's more going on there than uh, we've been led on to know. And I think that's where maybe uh, Gary Taylor and some of the other critics and editors of that uh, of those plays have, have been going. Uh, and it makes it a lot more interesting. It puts more people in the mix. And I, I, I find nothing wrong with sort of coming. But there's plenty of Shakespeare out there, you know, to to, uh, to, as you say, you know, lift up the uh, others into the canon and, and uh, give, give credit where credit can be given is, is good. People do get upset about the idea <laughs> of- Really, really of, <laughs> Yeah, very, very upset. Gotten upset with me and I haven't, and I've been very, very mild in some of my questionings, but yeah, this is revolutionary, Brett. Yeah, no, people get, people get very upset at the idea of taking taking away from Shakespeare and this notion of Shakespeare as a solitary genius. I mean, Shakespeare in many ways is an exceptional figure. He is, he is a really gifted dramatist. He, he, he is very good at stitching plays together. And, um, you know, anyone who's ever taught drama from the period and introduced students to other dramatists, uh, uh, um, you know, can see that in the way that students students sort of respond to, say, the way that Shakespeare seamlessly moved from scene to scene and subplot to subplot, versus, say, the way Webster, uh, uh, um, you know, who, who I really like, seems to be a lot more sort of patchy. He's, he's really good at, at, at uh, writing little vignettes, but stitching them together is not, is not his strong suit. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, that almost makes him more of a modern author because he's not so interested in giving us neat narratives and and this this uh, uh, um, sort of, sort of uh, polished uh, uh, product that's kind of rough and ready, uh, but but at the same time it's it's sort of raw and emotional and and um, uh, uh, psychological in a way that uh, some of Shakespeare's drama isn't. So yeah, people do get upset about. Uh, 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 um, the idea that you're um, sort of disintegrating the sort of great Shakespeare canon, but but I think you've been saying this. It is about giving credit where credit is due. We've known for quite some time that Shakespeare didn't write alone all the time. I mean, one of the ways that he's exceptional is that he was in a financial position where he where he could just write on his own if he wanted to. Uh, you know, he wasn't like some of these other playwrights who who relied on the odd sort of job of patching a scene up, uh, you know, for somebody else or sort of working in, working in sort of teams for Henslow, uh, you know, to put food on the table. Uh, but he still isn't um, above collaborating. And uh, um, partly, and this is getting back to the uh, sort of notion of Shakespeare's development as a dramatist that you were talking about with Dowden, uh, um, you know, part of this fits fits the sort of model of apprenticeship. So, so when Shakespeare first starts out, we we expect him to see him collaborating with more senior dramatists. And so, in Titus Andronicus, you've got him working with working with George Peel, 
but but also there's a sense of him sort of handing over the reins to the king's man later on to john fletcher mm -hmm. you know who 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 sort of comes to be the main dramatist once once shakespeare effectively retires um and so so shakespeare and fletcher uh uh, collaborate on several plays towards the end of Shakespeare's career. You know, we're still in the grips of, of that Victorian or maybe uh, romantic uh, notion of the single genius and, and packaging things in that way. And so, you know, and I, I, and I don't see that we're going to get away from it anytime soon, but then when the, the data is the, the data and it is, a, it is a kind of, I think for some, <laughs> sort of to go to the 16th century is sort of the same dawning that, you know, we're not at the center, you know, we, we go around the sun, the sun doesn't go around us and going through that same kind of, in a, in a much more, in a much smaller way, the uh, realization that, you know, come on, it drama, stage drama is nothing if it isn't collaborative. You know, you can't imagine a troupe of actors all coming in. You see it in Midsummer Night's Dream, where one actor wants to come in and change the line or do this or that, and 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 push it, and the director has to push back, and that sort of thing. That's just the that's the nature of the beast. Uh, it's it just it couldn't be anything else. That there is collaboration from the very beginning. Sure, but I think there's a danger in exaggerating the extent of that kind of collaboration. Mm -hmm. So, so um, uh, you know, the rude mechanicals in A Midsummer Night's Dream are, are a parody of the process. Mm -hmm. um, for, for the professional theater, everything had to go through the censors. Yes. And that cost, and that cost money. So uh, um, um, if, if you wanted to add content to a play, that new addition uh, um, had to go through censorship before you could actually perform it publicly. Cutting is not a problem. And so it makes sense for you to be submitting these, the, 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 these uh, play texts that are, that are actually too long uh, because it enables you to cut as you deem necessary. So in terms of that sort of uh, 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 um, negotiation between sort of uh, uh, the actors in in sort of determining the text. I think there are some there are some limitations, and they are financial. You do, of course, get get some plays where uh, um, there is a financial incentive to revitalize it and add new scenes. You know, Doctor Faustus is a good example here. But uh, 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 um, by and large, I think if if, if you're not sure you're going to make good on your investment you you're probably not gonna uh, uh, be adding anything to it yeah yeah and i'm going to push back on what i said i'm pushing back on myself you if you go to hamlet's advice to the actors you know is is uh you could use that as an example of of trying to maintain control the, do what is written down just because people start laughing at you you don't need to take it any further uh and add anything and i think there's twofold it, it can it can uh, destroy the, the 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 unity you're trying in the dramatic unity. It can it can mess up things formally, but also you can have actors say things that are that put put the uh, company on report with the wrong people, and you, as we both know, you can end up in the uh, in the can very easily if, if something's attributed to you that that gets the wrong person uh, uh, the wrong feathers ruffled. Um, and by the yeah. can, I mean in Marshall Sea or, or, you know, the fleet, or, you know, you, you're suddenly thrown in prison. One of the reasons why, uh, um, and I think Gabriel Egan points this out in one of his articles, is that uh, when, when somebody is offended uh, by, by a play, the buck stops with, with the author. Yeah. Uh, you know, so, so, so it is uh, sort of Ben Johnson and and uh, 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 um, George Chapman, uh, um, who gets thrown thrown yeah. in jail for Eastwood Ho, John Marston manages to sort of <laughs> e e uh, escape the authorities. I think uh, he, he um, went out to the country or something. 
probably Something to like a, that. a cousin's house to hide in the uh, somewhere behind the, uh, the chicken coop or whatever. But uh, yeah, no, but but they get, you know, so so there is a recognition that the authors are the ones who are responsible for the yeah. words. Yeah. Um, what's what's fascinating about that particular episode is that John Day and so day is the sort of next editorial project that i'm that i'm sort yeah, of looking at getting right. started in um he you would think that's a, a fellow dramatist seeing this happen to his to his to his fellow playwrights would would sort of learn and sort of exercise caution <laughs> but what does he do uh he writes the isle of gulls he puts the same sorts of offensive scottish stereotypes into into this play uh, uh and it it costs the company its royal patronage uh it, you know it basically spells the end of uh you know the 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 children of the queen's revels it, and uh, this was know. this was isle of dogs right is that no uh, no no this is the isle of gulls gulls, gulls that's right the gulls dogs got johnson dogs is gulls. nash John, John, yes. So they're two Johnson owls and Nash. There. Yeah. I, I've always thought that that owl, the use of the word owl, may have reflected the middle owl at St. Paul's, which was so notorious for the center of gossip. But there is actually a an island, I think, uh, a bit out there. Uh, so, yeah, gulls and not dogs. But uh, you, you don't want to be uh, caught in that trap. Well, yeah, you would think day, and we're talking about day for people who are doing the history of the book and that sort of thing. There, there are two great days. There, the the John Day of printing earlier, uh, mm. Elizabethan, and, and later, even before that, who was uh, remarkable in his own right as a printer and publisher. But then this is another uh, John Day who. Uh, yeah, here. no, so people often get really excited when I say that I'm sort of working on a critical edition of the works of John Day, and then their sort of faces drop and their hearts, hearts sort of slow down a bit when I explain that it's, it's not the printer of, uh, um, you know, the Book of Martyrs. This is, this is, this is the sort of hack dramatist, yeah. um, who, in some ways, uh, uh, um, the reason I'm so drawn to this as a project is because he, um, he's not exceptional. Uh, I think a lot of these editorial projects, say, take take the uh, Oxford Thomas Middleton, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, um, a lot of the rhetoric around that was was that Middleton could be the next Shakespeare. You know that he's another. You know that he's a diamond in the rough. Yeah. And uh, this this sort of rhetoric of exceptionalism is what gets uh, a, a, um, sort of public interest, but also gets uh, grant funding. Um, the problem with exceptions is that they only tell a, 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 a part of the story. So before you were saying that, uh, you know, if you were going to do a history of rock and roll and you only focused on the Beatles, that's a very different history to uh, say, say the history of rock and roll that looks at everybody uh, or that looks at sort of these jobbing bands or looks at, looks at session musicians who, who are recorded on, multiple albums for different bands but who aren't frontmen right. you know who aren't sort of full-time members of a particular band yeah. uh in a way uh focusing on someone like day is like focusing on a session musician yeah this is this is somebody who comes to london to apply his trade as a professional writer uh he writes for boys companies as well as adult companies uh he writes in in uh you know he writes tragedies he writes comedies uh he collaborates with everybody including thomas decker uh christopher marlowe uh and, and possibly also shakespeare but yeah. um you know he writes on his own but usually in collaboration and so the the hope in setting out on this new project is that by looking at a figure like day we're actually going to get a different picture of uh, the literary and theatrical culture of early modern England, because we're not looking at an exception. We're actually looking at, uh, 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 you know, someone that's a lot more representative of, uh, you know, the work. Yeah, it's it's so much 
it enriches the study of the field so much more to examine what you're talking about. And that is moving into really what is infrastructure. I mean, what mm -hmm. is a Nashville, a great Nashville uh, musician without that guy who comes in and plays the, um, the lead guitar or uh, has a, uh, or the mandolin, you know, who he, he can't put out mandolin albums and become famous, but you got to have that person there because he's the only one who can understand what the uh, lead artist is trying to do and can fit in with the program. And uh, that's what I, I hope for. And even expand beyond that to the infrastructure of the stage and staging and all of those things that happened in this time, which, you know, basically just all of this, we can see it as cultural historians, just all of this out of nowhere, just sprung up out of nowhere. And, and I know, you know, I read the, the older critics and they like to talk about the development from village festivals to, you know, morality and, and uh, mystery plays and that sort of thing. And those things were there. But if you look at around the year uh, uh, 1570, it's an explosion. And it's undoubtedly, it's undoubtedly something that was just not precedented. But I'm interested also, we talked to, about computers and digital a lot here. I, you do literary and cultural history and I brought up cultural history and you've done work uh, on, I'm looking at your website here, changing socio-political agendas and recent projects includes articles on Jews and Judaism and an article on Catholicism, witchcraft and Elizabethan court drama. My goodness, that's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of research. <laughs> I thought when I was gonna interview you that I would have to actually wait until post pandemic where I could get a handheld camera and chase you down the street uh, because, <laughs> because I don't know how you get time. But when I saw um, that, I thought of Shapiro's work on uh, the Merchant of Venice. I think I'm right. And I might have to go back and look at this. But he began that humorously by saying, uh, you know, being Jewish himself, how he really wanted to stay away from that. Just leave that to another, because it was so distracting. But you kind of took this on, head on and, and also religion head on. So how did how did what led you to this well well i'm i'm an atheist myself but uh, as somebody who's interested in pre-modern culture i think i think religion is is absolutely fascinating and and that uh, without it we'd be uh, um sort of much poorer culturally i suppose what uh, drew, drew me to sort of jews and judaism uh in this period is the way that they are uh um absent presences that that these Jews are officially not uh, present and recognized and allowed into uh, um, the country but but they are repeatedly being used uh, uh, um, in sermons and 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 in the literature you know so they have they have uh, um, uh, quite a lot of cultural baggage and uh, sort of cultural force. Uh, so, so I was interested in looking at the ways that sort of Jews and Judaism are represented in early English literature. And uh, some of these are um, surprising. So I, I've looked at the way that, um, say depictions of the owl in the medieval bestiaries mm -hmm. and, and in, uh, church decorations like roof bosses and misery cord carvings uh, actually reflect anti-Judaic, anti-Semitic narratives. Uh, um, but how these, these same sort of metaphors and emblems are taken and used and adapted during the Reformation by Catholics and Protestants alike. So that you've got Protestants slandering Catholics as being uh, 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 um, Judaizers, you know, for their love of pomp and ceremony. At the same time, you've got Catholics who are who are accusing Protestants of being a bit too Jewish because they're focused on the literal interpretation of Scripture. Uh, and then, of course, the Puritans get get uh, uh, um, sort of teased for being for being Jewish and 
for being owlish because they're you know they're staying up late and they're reading the scripture by candlelight and they're and they're going blind uh, uh um, you know and they're wearing glasses and there are some wonderful woodcuts and engravings that are carrying these kind of political and a theological polemic just through the figure of the Jew and the owl. That was an unexpected, uh, but, but, but fascinating story. The, the stuff about Catholicism and witchcraft and court drama that, that was um, while I was, while I was preparing texts for computational an analysis, I was noticing that there, there were um, sort of references to Medusa in a, a text that I was tagging. Uh, and this is this is Anthony Monday's uh, yeah. Fidel and Fortunio. Yeah. And I just thought, why are there references to Medusa in this? Uh, and then I read the play and uh, decided that there was something interesting going on here about sort of the use of wax figures in witchcraft uh, uh, in this play. It, it's a fascinating play. It's it's not a good play by any stretch of the imagination, but it is a fascinating play because it's not an original. It is, it is an Italian play that's been translated. So Monday is uh, 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 um, first and foremost a translator. Uh, uh, um, I mean, he's also a spy and an informer and all of those other wonderful things that yes. somebody who is good with languages uh, um, sort of naturally sort of falls into. But um, what's interesting is looking at the things that he translates and the things that he, things that he adapts. So, so, so his uh, fidelity, if you'll excuse the pun, uh, to the original uh, uh, um, sort of makes for an interesting study as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, you know, we could go on and on because you and I overlap so much in our interests. Now here you have the prestige, the bardolatry of Shakespeare, somewhere this, this big ship carrying these other ships with it. And the, the water rises, you know, all of them rise as this, the water around Shakespeare rises. But then in another way, you have Shakespeare eclipsing you know, the, the others, but I'm interested in young, and I, I'm, I'm from the American South, the countryside and so forth. You're Australian, you were born Australian. Why in the world are you studying Shakespeare? What are you going to do with that? I mean, at what point did, did you, and I had no answer for him, but at what point did you decide, okay, I'm just going to be a literary guy and did it start with Shakespeare? Or did it start somewhere else? And at what point in your childhood or in your undergraduate training or whatnot, uh, where was the turning point or if there was one? That's a good question. Um, I, was, I was born in South Africa. So I'm from Johannesburg. I didn't uh, know that. Um, uh, it sometimes comes out, especially when I'm talking to my parents. Uh, but uh, um, we immigrated to uh, Perth in. Western Australia when I was 12 years old. Uh, so I spent most of my life uh, in uh, Australia. I think I identify culturally as an Australian. I think mostly because that gives me permission to swear. Um, uh, I had my first teaching job in New Zealand uh, covering for Lynn Tribble when she had a uh, uh, um, sort of a big grant that sort of bought her out of her teaching. Uh, but then I, I've uh, sort of worked in Canada and uh, spent time in the US. And so you end up with this sort of bastardized mongrel accent that I've got. And now I'm in the UK and, uh, you know, people, people here are just as baffled uh, at uh, trying to understand what I'm saying as they are back home. When I went to university, I was originally studying law. Uh, I was uh, a law and philosophy. Uh, I was interested in the philosophy of religion. I was interested in uh, sort of philosophy of human nature and, and uh, sort of the history, history of philosophy. Uh, uh, um, I had originally hoped to uh, uh, go into psychiatry, but I didn't, didn't sort of uh, uh, um, get, the, get the grades uh, uh, um, for that. But, but you know, uh, I did get the grades for law. Make of that what you will. Um, I was a terrible law student, absolutely terrible, but, uh, I took some elective modules in English that were taught by Chris Wortham, 
who is a, a fabulous teacher who is uh, who who is still there uh, and, and and still in Perth and is and is sort of uh, putting the finishing touches on his on his book on Shakespeare and um, and sort of cultural mapping. I was infected by Chris's passion for 16th and 17th century literature, and I thought, okay, this is what I want to do. And so I did my honors thesis with Chris. And on the strength of that, I did my PhD uh, with Chris. And so, so, so really, I've always loved literature. Um, I did well in, at literature and history. And, and uh, because of that, I got the grades to enable me to do sort of law and uh, sort of study, study at university. But I'd never thought seriously about be, you know, becoming an academic or actually teaching, teaching literature. But now um, I can't imagine doing anything else, really. Uh, I think I think um, it's such a privilege, uh, you know, to teach to teach this material and to uh, hopefully inspire students in the same ways that uh, um, you know my supervisor Chris Wortham did back then. I mean, if it wasn't for him, I'd be I'd be a struggling uh, ambulance chaser in Perth. I'm sure. I'd be, a ter- I'd be a terrible lawyer, you know, with those terrible adverts, uh, you know, really, really struggling. But, yeah, but American um, series, Better Call Saul, you know, you're there with the, at the bus stop uh, <laughs> with yeah. the, yeah, the um, uh, outdoor Have you been injured while at, yeah. Have yeah. you been injured while at work? Uh, it's, it's, it's terrible. But, but so, so either, either, uh, um, you know, many thanks or, uh, blame and recrimination to uh, Professor Chris Wortham. Well, Professor Chris Wortham, just like us, did not inspire everybody. And I think that's something that's a, a kind of teaching moment for us. I've struggled for years, but then if I look at the students, it didn't everyone, in fact, it's, it's hardly, uh, I don't know what percentage, I would say at least 30% probably appreciate uh, what I've done. But you do get those. You do get those who come through. And we were one of those. So uh, I, I think that's sort of my message for people who teach out there. We tend to focus on that kid who just doesn't get it and doesn't come to class and uh, doesn't like us or doesn't like the subject. But this, uh, we don't focus on the people we have been able to influence in, in various ways. But I, w- I want to segue into your teaching. You do some very interesting work with print as we kind of start to finish up here a little bit. I'm very curious about what it is actually you do with hands-on uh, printing techniques uh, in your class and how you how you were able to set that up. I didn't have to set anything up. I mean, uh, um, when, I, when I went to visit Leeds, when I had the job interview there, uh, uh, Martin Butler sort of showed me around the buildings and took me into the basement where we have uh, uh, four fully functional Victorian printing presses oh. uh, uh, um, you know, uh, that had been set up uh, previously by uh, 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 um, John Barnard, uh, so, sort of a towering figure in, in textual criticism and the history of the book um, that had sort of been languishing. It, it has been revived by, by um, some of my colleagues, uh, um, in particular Jim Mussel, who sort of works on Victorian print culture. But uh, we now use those printing presses and there's a separate paper making room. There's a, 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 a composing room with, with uh, sort of 10 different typesetting cases and, and you know, tons of type. Uh, and we've got a bindery there you know so we've got the full we've got the full setup uh and i like to take students in there uh when i teach renaissance literature because uh i think giving them a sense of the material conditions of uh um you know how these how these books actually found their way into print can go some ways to explaining some of the some of the oddities some of the unresolved questions uh, you know that we we have to consider as as textual scholars. So um, one of the things that I like to uh, show the students is what happens when you turn sort of uh, a lowercase letter U upside down. You know, you get 
a lowercase letter n. Well, okay, this is this is a really simple mistake to make, but it does have material consequences. When you go and you have a look at the way that Othello was printed and you end up with that famous textual crooks, uh, uh, whether it's a reference to a Judean or an Indian, uh, you know, and as an, as an editor or as a director, you have to pick one or the other. You can't have Othello come out and go, you know, the base Indian, take two, the base Judean, you've got to pick one and run with it. And so I think getting students to actually get their hands dirty and uh, um, I've had students set, set um, uh, sort of uh, lines from a sonnet each and then we put it all together and, and sort of print it and they all get to take home a copy of this. Uh, uh, but, but part of the fun is seeing just how easy it is to make mistakes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But but I, uh, so it's not something that I've had to set up. It was there. I was I, I was really lucky that uh, um, you know we have these resources. But but I think uh, it, if you add an institution that doesn't have those things, there are uh, people who are making um, affordable tabletop uh, uh, printing presses, uh, which 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 are great substitutes. I think there's one called the Beetle Press, which is fabulous. So if, if you're at a small institution that doesn't have, you know, a 19th century Apple Beyond Press just sitting there, you know, you can still, you just don't engage in this kind of hands-on work. Yeah, it, this is something I would really like to segue into myself. Uh, it, I, I, every year, of course, I try to explain just simply the difference between quarto and folio for say an undergraduate class and it just, uh, it almost excites them, but they, me folding the paper and saying, this is how you do it. It would be so much better if I could take them into a room and say, okay, we're going to print a quarto uh, with just one page. And I'm gonna show you what you need to think about in order to set the type in here. And we're gonna get the big blotter uh, fortunately for me, I was invited to a, a little afternoon session at Keio University, where, where uh, it was hosted by a, a gentleman, an antiquarian who just had one of these presses. And they have a, a Gutenberg at Keio. So he set it up for one page of the Gutenberg. And there were 10 of us, and we all did our own page and pressed. And after that, and you'd be interested in this because they had the digital guys there who digitized what we had pressed and we did everything the same and then they went down into the minutia they they focused in and talked about the difference in the print and trying yeah. to uh one of the one of the guys there was working with manuscripts and of course their dream is to try to get machine uh, readable and searchable manuscripts and in some cases in ancient chinese which you know gets into a the weeds very quickly but the, mm. the activity of doing that, I thought when I was there, oh, if I could just bring my students, my seminar class in to do this, what a wonderful day in class. You know, it's just right there. They learn so much more than I could ever teach them about this, talking about it. And you learn uh, so much yourself just by doing. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. but it is dirty business. Uh, uh, um, oh, it's dirty. You know, the ink. It the, is dirty. You know, the ink is the ink is unforgiving. It is so, unforgiving. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I know from that experience and from other experiences, of course, I think anybody's had the experience of changing the ink on their uh, printer, uh, their cartridge, yeah. and not doing it quite right. And there you are. But this is much messier. This is uh, this is definitely a, a, a lot. Uh, well, what I'm doing, I, there's a thunderstorm <laughs> coming through outside, and I, I sense that the gods are mad with me in some ways, but. Uh, uh, what I want to do is is sort of close off. Is there anything else that you want to feature or something you would like to uh, talk about in terms of where your career is going? And you, you have, I, I'm not even asking you the question I usually ask people because you have such a, uh, we were talking about cathedrals before, you have these projects that are endless, <laughs> that are ongoing. And of course, you're going to be talking to David McInnes, who's uh, you know yeah. a, good, a good friend of mine, and he's also one of these cathedral builders. He um, is. And 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 sort of part of the job of of uh, of putting together these projects is thinking about contingencies. 
you know, you don't want to be in a position, say, like uh, um, Fretz and Bowers, who, who you know, uh, 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 um, died uh, uh, before they had finished doing the Cambridge edition of the works yes. in the in the Beaumont and Fletcher, yeah. and, and and then poor Robert Turner had to sort of jump in and, and sort of try to try to try to get things working again. Yeah, um, Chapman Chapman to Marlowe or something like that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No. The, uh, so so um, I think a, a lot of that is about uh, um, recognizing uh, your own limitations. Um, I think what's 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 great about the sort of work that that um that w we're doing is that it's collaborative and it doesn't all fall to me which is which is a great relief but i also uh, uh, i mean have the privilege of working with some really smart uh, really intimidatingly smart people yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, um, who i'm able to uh, draw on but also uh, give them a platform that's the kind of work that i want to do um i think if there was anything else that I wanted to say, it, it, it's just that um, uh, it's probably not all just down to Chris. I think the other thing that was um, sort of unique and special about the Australian and New Zealand context is that the the uh, group of uh, sort of Shakespeareans and early modernists are very close in Australia and New Zealand, and the quality of work that's produced there is really high. Yeah. Um, but but. Um, it's a really supportive network. They really fostered my career. And I've tried to keep in touch. And uh, sort of one of the big promises that I have to keep, uh, you know, once this pandemic is over, is that I do want to keep going back to the Australian and New Zealand Shakespeare Association conferences, because that's really where I cut my teeth, but also met um, some of my oldest academic friends, yeah. uh, you know, like like David, like Laurie, like Daryl Chalk, Mark Houlihan, yeah. Uh, um, yeah. and Hugh Craig, you know, people who I still still sort of uh, work with and, uh, uh, you know, Lynn Tribble, uh, you know, people who I, who I greatly admire. Yeah. I hope that on one, on one of those trips that you can uh, make a stop in Tokyo and come and maybe uh, talk with one of my classes and, and so forth. I'm, I'm hoping that's in the future. Uh, I'd love to go back to Japan. I, I, uh, yeah. um, my uh, my husband and I uh, uh, went to Japan for our honeymoon. We spent ten days. Oh, really? Where did you go? We spent ten days in Japan. You can see I, I've got um, that sort of owl uh, thing in the background. That sort of. Oh curtain. yes. Yeah. Um, yes. Another okay, so owl. We spent, yes. We spent four days in Tokyo, yeah. uh, three days in Kyoto, and three days in. Nagasaki, uh, Houston Bosch, uh, yeah. because because we wanted to hang out with the capybaras at the Nagasaki Biopark. That, well, you've been somewhere yeah. I haven't been. I have never been to Nagasaki. Oh, uh, it's uh, phenomenal. And, and uh, it, it is, it is. And it's, there's so much history there when you're talking about the history of religion globally or to Christian religion uh, in Japan. And I wanna make it there one day. I lived in Hiroshima for a period. Uh, and the, but most of my Japan experience has been in Tokyo, and uh, uh, it, well, you were on your honeymoon, so that was a uh, that was a honeymoon. But the next time you're uh, you're here, uh, I'm I will take it as a personal affront if you don't contact me and let me <laughs> uh, let me uh, uh, drag you off the street and talk to some of my students and so forth, and and perhaps we can go out and get something good to eat too. That's something. Perfect. That, uh, and uh, I think that there are people, uh, colleagues of mine in the uh, Shakespeare Society of Japan who would be delighted to, to meet you. You probably have run across Sarah Olive also. Uh, I have, yeah. yeah. And, Sarah's uh, just up in York. Yeah, up in York. And, uh, and of course, our mutual friend Pip and perhaps Ben Crystal. Uh, there's a mm -hmm. sort of uh, group, group of us and Ben is, uh, is dying to get back here. And I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get people to come but it's expensive to invite a lot of people but if you're coming through anyway you see it's cheaper then, to jump yeah yeah you can just come in and we can, and then it's cheaper to put you up and and then we can maybe uh provide a little honorarium and that kind of thing and and i uh, have a good little civilized afternoon with um, i think that'd be fabulous some and literary course, nerds 
Yeah. <laughs> okay. And of course, if you're ever up here in the north, do let us know. We've got a guest room here in Leeds. Uh, ex- um, I would I would love to see. I, I have been through uh, several times. I haven't, of course, this past year. Uh, I, normally, we take a group to Oxford, uh, usually uh, in the uh, in the summer for a little summer program, which is also all, a lot of fun for me because you have some of my favorite things in the world, and that's the Bodleian, uh, long walks and beautiful areas, and the pub. I, I like the pub too. Uh, but the uh, uh, I, I would like you to stay a little bit after we finish, but before we do, I wanted to extend my thanks to you. I didn't give you a lot of he- heads up for this, and uh, I'm just delighted to have you and to be able to put you in a series with David and maybe some other people who are doing work that overlaps. Uh, this really, really helps us at our university and a, uh, a grant funded program that I'm doing now, but also another digital, much smaller digital project than uh, what you're doing. We're working with the Folger a little bit to share mm-hmm. some special collections of ours. But yeah, you, this is the Bible stuff. I, the Bible. I, and we're, yeah, we're getting... I had a look. Oh, oh good. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, I had a look. Gonna, You've got some fabulous copies. <laughs> the, yes, okay, good. There's a, yeah, and we're acquiring uh, the editions of the Bible Society of Japan, and I think they have a first edition King James. I just haven't been allowed to, not allowed to, but nobody's been allowed to do anything over the past yeah. year. So at one point, I want to get in and see what they have, but we might have, we might be able to assemble a, a very, very, um, yeah, if not world class, at least in Japan, one of the finer collections, and we'd love to share those, of course, with the Folger and anybody else out there. But uh, thank you so much for coming on. And my best to you and yours there in Lee. Uh, absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me, Tom. It's, uh, uh, you know, really lovely to see you again. And hopefully it won't be another seven years until we do this. I know. That's just too long, Brett. Okay. Yeah. That's all for now. But do stay for just one moment. Okay, great. Thanks okay. again. Uh-huh. Thank you. Thank you.